In the year 1162, King Henry II had a brilliant plan to uh, curb the growing power of the church. He nominated his close friend and chancellor, Thomas Becket, to become Archbishop of Canterbury. In one decisive move, Henry II was going to control the politics as well as the religion in uh, France. But this plan backfired because he actually did appoint Thomas Becket as the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. But when Becket was consecrated, a profound change came over him. He suddenly realized that he had a higher loyalty than serving the king. Now he would with all his heart to please God and to do his will. In the movie that's entitled Becket, that moment of transformation is captured in one of the archbishop's prayers as he kneels before the Lord. This is what Becket says in that movie. Please, Lord, teach me now how to serve you with all my heart, to know at last what it really is to love, to adore, so that I may worthily administer your kingdom here upon earth and find my true honor in observing your divine will. Please, Lord, make me worthy. So he became the true Archbishop of Canterbury to the dismay of Henry II. Too bad. Uh, his political aspirations didn't uh, work out the way he wanted them to. You know, it's almost like uh, children performing for our parents in a backyard play. We long to receive the applause, the approval, the divine well done from our Heavenly Father. Uh, as I approach old age and realize that my time on earth is more past than it will be present, what do we want to hear? Well done, you good and faithful servant. Who wouldn't want to hear that? Everyone uh, desires that. And I have desired that my whole life, but becomes even more meaningful the older I get. In the weight of glory and other addresses, in an essay entitled, The Weight of Glory, uh, well, before we look at that, let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.9, because that brings to light what we want to talk about this morning. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So our desire should be, and I've underlined it for that reason, to be pleasing to the Lord, to be pleasing to the Father in heaven. Now, C.S. Lewis writes about this in uh, this article, The Weight of Glory. He says, the promise of glory is the promise almost incredible and only possible by the work of Christ that some of us, that any of us who really chooses shall actually survive that examination, shall find approval, shall please God. To please God to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in, as an artist delights in his work, or a father, a son, it seems impossible, a weight or burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain. But so it is. We have a responsibility to please God. And all we have to do is look in the mirror and realize, boy, that person isn't pleasing God. That person is doing things that they shouldn't do. They're saying things that they shouldn't say. They're thinking thoughts that they shouldn't think. So we look in the mirror and we think, how can God be pleased with this? Well, in Greek mythology, a man named Sisyphus was uh, the founder and king of Corinth. He was condemned by Zeus to push a heavy rock up a steep hill for all eternity. Every time Sisyphus would near the pinnacle of the hill, 
the stone would roll back to the beginning and he'd have to go and begin to push it up again. And certainly that was his own form of hell. And of course we don't uh, believe in Greek mythology, but it does kind of suggest to us we're told to please God. We look in the mirror and we don't. And as a result, many Christians feel that way about the weight of their sins. No matter how hard they try, no matter how many times they repent or resolve to do better, they believe they can never do enough. <coughs> they can never satisfy God's demands, much less please Him. So, will you get me some water, please? <coughs> We must understand that there's a balance somewhere here. We need to strive to please God. There's no doubt about that. You and I must be pleasing to the Lord. And yet we look at ourselves and we think, God can't be pleased with this. And we need to have a balance of the two. Thanks. Paul leaves behind the apologetic concerns that have preoccupied his attention in the first half of this letter, which he is writing on the second missionary journey. <coughs> and he takes up the uh, exhortative concerns that dominate the second half of the book. Uh, chapters 4, 1 through 5, 22 <coughs> really are application. Uh, chapters 1 through 3 are doctrine, and yet we don't totally leave teaching, and that's uh, never Paul's uh, uh, place. He always includes with the application more teaching or teaching that's building on previous teaching. And that's really what we get throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians. Remember in chapter 1 we had the ten pillars. Four of faith, uh, three of uh, love and three of hope. And he is using these pillars of faith to uh, apply the concepts there. What were the four pillars of faith? We had the Word of God, we had assurance, we had Christ likeness. Uh, now, the Word of God is four, isn't it? We had uh, election, assurance. Christ likeness in the Word of God. So those are the four things that Paul is applying to different things. And we saw in chapter 3 that he applied it to suffering. Those four things he applied to suffering. Very clearly in his writing you can see it uh, so easily. Well now he is going to apply these four things again to the process of sanctification. So we're going to look at sanctification over the next three weeks, including today. Uh, the sanctification of these concepts of the pillars of faith uh, this week and next week, and then the pillars of love in the week after that. And then we're going to look at the pillars of hope as he gives a great uh, exposition on the end times, on the rapture, on the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we'll look at that as we look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. So uh, the apostle is, is going to exhort these believers according to these pillars of the faith. So it's very important that we understand how he is building. He not only gives us the pillars, but then he applies them first to suffering and persecution because that is what they were uh, living through. And then their need to be sanctified. So we talked about that in Sunday school a little bit, Paul did. And so we need to have that sanctification process going. So, we are exhorted to please God by progressing from justification to sanctification as we live out our faith, love, and hope in Christ. 
we have to progress on. We can't just sit around on our laurels thinking I'm justified. Weeha, you know, uh, you can't do that. Now you should rejoice in your salvation. Uh, you definitely should praise God every day for your salvation. The prophets praise God. Uh, they, they, in the area of salvation, they long to understand it. And of course, uh, the Holy Spirit revealed salvation. The apostles proclaimed salvation. And as a result, we... Uh, look at salvation as the central theme of all the Word of God and it's very important that we do that. Well we can only look at one pillar this morning and it's primarily because of what Paul talks about in verse 1. So first of all we want to see the sanctification of faith and he's going to talk about the four pillars. We're going to look at one today and then three next week. One today, three next week in verses four, or chapter four, one through eight. And then the command of the faith from God. The faith from God is the first thing that we want to look at. The faith is from God, that's the source. And the command for faith is given, a command for a growing manifestation of faith in Verse 1, now look at what it says. The remaining, therefore, brothers, we ask you and exhort in the Lord Jesus in order that just as you receive from us how it is necessary for you to walk and to please God, just as also you are walking, in order that you abound more. Now let me point something out here grammatically. And I realize some of you turn me off when I do this. But uh, for some of you, you really are concerned and want to know, go deeper. Uh, let's look at this just a little bit. The structure in Hebrew is often A, B, C, B, A. You have this idea here in verse 1. The remaining, therefore, brothers, we ask you and exhort in the Lord in order that you may abound more. You see how the two uh, complement each other. Uh, the both A's. And then B, in order that just as you receive from us, B, so the second B, just as you are walking, so you have those counterparts. And the key is the center. Whenever you uh, get into Hebrew writing, it's often the center that is the main thrust of the verse. And it says how it is necessary for you to walk and to please God. That is Paul's major thing here in applying the ten pillars of faith, love, and hope. Pleasing God. When you, you want to please God, then do these pillars of faith, love, and hope. If you do those, you will be pleasing to God. And so important that we see this emphasis. And that's why I'm going to spend a lot of time on pleasing God. Because that is the thrust of Paul in this verse. Paul is mindful of God's working in them and their desire to please God. So he asks and exhorts them. Uh, the word exhort here is parakaleo. Uh, the Holy Spirit's nickname is paraclete or the one who comes alongside to help. So Paul is exhorting them. Paul is coming alongside the Thessalonian church through writing this letter to help them to understand the things that are important for them. He's coming alongside them to help their understanding. And that's the idea here. In this case, he is helping their spiritual growth. They are already pleasing the Lord, Paul says. But Paul realized that growth in faith and love lasts until we see Christ. We never stop growing. And hopefully you see that in your life. As you get older, you see more humility, you see more kindness, you see more love. That's what you should see, and more of a hatred for sin. So they're pleasing God already, already but Paul wants them to never be content. You never rest on your laurels. You never remain stagnant 
in your spiritual growth. Uh, you don't want to do that. That's why you need to be in the Word of God every day. Not just reading it, but studying it in depth. Because that is going to keep you growing and maturing in Christ. So we must never be content. Spiritual growth must never stop. And he knew they needed to know more of God's word. They haven't had much teaching yet. And he's trying to help them to better understand God and his word. And in this case, he wants them to abound so that you can abound still more or you can excel still more. Uh, Peri Suo uh, is that abundantly supplied, overflow, exist in full quantity, uh, surpassing that idea to excel to a higher degree. He doesn't want them to stay where they're at. He wants them to excel to a higher degree. And Paul talks about this a lot throughout his letters. Let's just look at a few letters that speak of this. 1 Corinthians 14, 12, he says, So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. So he wanted them to abound still more and more. Philippians 1, 9, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Notice how he ties in love with knowledge and discernment. Your love is going to be greater the better you understand God and his word. And your love in the opposite way is going to be very surfacy and flaky if you are not studying God's word. So it's important that we do that. In 2 Thessalonians, the second letter that Paul writes to the Thessalonian church, he says, And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. So love us just like we love you. That's the idea. And then in chapter 4, verse 10 of 2 Thessalonians, for indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Now it sounds like that, you know, Paul is not satisfied. That Paul is a perfectionist and he is just demanding and demanding and demanding. But that's because God demands of us to be holy even as he is holy. So we never reach it in this life. We're battling the flesh. We never make perfection, no matter what Watchman Nee used to say. Uh, we never reach uh, a sinless perfection, which is what he taught. Uh, we do not reach that, and it's very clear in God's word that we do not reach it. But we need spiritual progress motivated by a, de a desire to know God. The desire to know and please God becomes the motivation to be in God's word, to grow spiritually. And you can tell when you're not in God's word and the motivation has grown cold. If you're regularly reading and studying the word of God, your motivation for spiritual growth will never grow cold. Guaranteed. I can guarantee that. And this is another important truth. Your desire to know God should be even greater than knowing God's word. Although the two are inextricably linked. You can't know God without knowing his word. But your desire to know God should excel even above your desire to know God's word. And that means that we can't just study God's word and not have it impact our relationship with God. Then you become a Pharisee. Then you become a legalist. And so we don't want to go there either, do we? Uh, we want to be in a vibrant spiritual relationship with God who is spirit. And that we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Activities will not bring spiritual growth unless they're linked to a desire to know God and his word. I don't care what you do. It's going to be meaningless unless you have a desire to know God and to know his word. So you can work your tail off 
and you're not going to accomplish anything spiritually if it is not being impacted by God and his word. Look at what Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 3 of uh, the book of Philippians, starting in verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ." and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now Paul uses an interesting word here in the Greek, in uh, uh, verse uh, uh, 8, he talks about counting all things as rubbish. The word for rubbish here is the Greek word skabala. Skabala was a swear word in the Greek language. So Paul is trying to bring out the truth. You know, you can talk about manure. But if you really want to make a point, and we shouldn't, we use the S word, right? That's what Paul is doing here. Paul is saying that this is so bad, it's like the worst cesspool. All of these things are thrown into the septic tank because that's where they belong. They're skabala. They're manure. They're rubbish. And that's what happens when we are concerned about pleasing God. Now, we want to talk about pleasing God, and actually these points come from MacArthur, some of the verses I've added myself, but uh, these points come from MacArthur's commentary, and it's about pleasing God. And I wanted to spend some time on this because that's Paul's key motivation. Everything that follows in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 2 through 5, 22, 23, uh, it all has to do with pleasing God. So that's why we learn doctrine. We learn doctrine so that we can live doctrine and please God. That's so important for us. Well, let's look at this. Uh, Paul and Silas. Timothy had taught the Thessalonians how they ought to live as Christians, and they were already obeying what they had heard, but he says you've got to go further. And now, what is it that they're doing that's pleasing to God? Well, the first thing you do to please God is confess sins. You confess your sins. Now, what does that mean? Confession is simply agreeing. It means, actually, to agree with God. In other words, God has established his moral law, and you have failed, and I have failed his moral law. And so we confess that sin, or we agree with God that he's right and we're wrong. And after our sins have been uh, taken away through the blood of Christ, and God doesn't look, us, look at us as having sin anymore, we still must confess our sin to always agree with God. And we're to confess our sin to one another so that there's accountability. But we're always agreeing with God that what he says about morality is right and what we are living is not right. And we strive to live the right way. So the first time you ever did anything that was pleasing to God was when you confessed your sin. Look at what uh, Joshua says to Achan. Remember, Achan was caught in sin. He had taken things that should have been wiped out in fire because they were to be an offering to the Lord. And Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. 
So the first time you ever gave glory to God, the first time you ever gave praise to God that was acceptable to him, the first time you were ever pleasing to God is when you confessed your sin, when you repented of your sin. And some people just can't get past that first step because of pride, because of arrogance. You have to be humble to confess your sin and to tell God he's right and you're wrong. And that's a very hard step for some people and some will go to hell because they will not get past that first step. And of course God has to get us past that first step, doesn't he? That's the only way it's going to happen. So the second thing is to pray continually and trust him. To pray continually and trust him. Uh, James 1.6 says, But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So we've got to trust him. We've got to pray and trust him. And as James goes on to say, that don't be uh, a do pasuke. In other words, don't have a dual personality. Don't be a Christian schizophrenic. Don't live like the world and call yourself a Christian. That's a Christian schizophrenic. And we need to be so careful not to habitually live lives like that. In other words, if we do, God's not going to answer our prayers. He's not going to listen to us. Well, the third thing, to pursue humility to pursue humility. Uh, look at James 4, 6. But he gives a greater grace, therefore it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you realize that God says through the book of Proverbs seven things that he hate? And the first thing is a haughty spirit. A proud spirit. God hates that. Pride is everything God doesn't want you to be. And humility is everything God does want you to be. So if we look at it like that and realize that he hates pride, God hates pride, we should hate it as well. And then number four, to be content with God's will. To be content with God's will as it's revealed in God's word. So we need to be content with his will. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 uh, says, So you have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Uh, Peter's just been talking about his transfiguration experience, and he says that having the word of God is better than seeing Jesus transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. We would think, boy, seeing Jesus is the best. Peter says, no, having the Word of God is the best. Because that experience was fleeting. It happened for a moment in time, and then it was over. The Word of God we have with us our entire lives. Number five, he says to be willing to suffer for his name. To be willing to suffer. If you want to please God, you've got to be willing to suffer for his name. And that's what's happening to the believers in many countries, not just Ukraine, but Russia and China and many African nations, the South Pacific nations. Uh, Christians are just hurt so badly and uh, punished and persecuted so horribly. In Burma, what used to be Burma, Myanmar, uh, you've got tremendous persecution of believers there. And it is something that we should be praying and concerned about. But what does 2 Timothy 3.12 tell us? Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I've emphasized this verse many, many times. And you ought to memorize it because this is your destiny 
as a believer. You're going to complete the sufferings of Christ. Don't be surprised by it. Accept it. Actually, revel in it. What did the apostles do when they were beaten? They left rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer for his name. Wow. And what do we see in Hebrews 13 when they're confiscating their property? Again, the same thing. They were rejoicing that God saw fit to allow them to be worthy to suffer for his name's sake. So the next time somebody comes into your house and starts carrying things out, the Bible tells us we ought to rejoice because we know that that stuff isn't eternal. All the stuff that we have is not eternal. It's all going to be burned up. It's all going to go by the wayside. And when we live with heaven in mind, we're not concerned about earthly treasures. Uh, so important that we grasp that. Well, number six, to evangelize the lost. You want to please God? You lead other people to Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you that some will believe because God has elected them to believe. So some will believe. Hey, we ought to be happy. We're going to get a return. It may only be about 10% of the people we talk to, but we will get a return. And sometimes we get to be in the, on the harvest. When I was uh, in my first uh, paid church ministry, Starting in 1980, uh, our youth group had about 20 kids. Our church was around two and a quarter. And uh, we had about 20 kids in the youth group. And the youth leaders were getting burnt out. They didn't want to do it. I said, let the college kids do youth group for the summer. And I'll work with them and mentor them. And you guys can take time off. Well, those college kids... I mean, they came to me and they said, Pastor Steve, whatever you want us to do, we're here. Blanket statement. Are you willing to say that to uh, Pastor Danny Martin? Whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do. Well, that's what they did. And you want to see a harvest when people have that attitude of humility. Within a month, we had 60 kids. Within three months, we had 125 kids coming out twice a week. By that October, we had 400 kids, almost twice the size of the church. That is a harvest that comes when people have humility and are willing to do whatever it takes. And many of those, I, I've counted up over 50 of those kids are either missionaries or pastors or full-time teachers in Christian schools. It wasn't some flaky thing happening. These people were really committed. And some, we know of one girl that's in uh, the Arab world uh, as a missionary, teaching English so she could get into the country, but then striving to raise up a church. That is what it means to please God, to evangelize the lost. In 06 and 07, when Susan and I and Jessica and on the second trip, of my two sons went also to uh, the Philippines, we had a tremendous opportunity to speak the gospel. Over there, you can go into the public schools and proclaim Christ. You can't do that here anymore. But we were able to do it there. And we were able to share the gospel in a, about a four week time over those two years uh, with 10,000 people. And the, year, uh, the pastor there, Pastor Abraham, estimated that between six and 7,000 of those people received Christ. And of the 15 Baptist churches in, in uh, uh, what was it, Isulan, of the 15 Baptist churches there, he said they either doubled or tripled in size. That's being in on the harvest. 
Believe me, I've spent many of years just planting seed. When we were up in New England, all we could do was plant seed. And we're hearing trickles out of those people. They came to know Christ well after we left New England. Planting seed is hard. Planting seed is hard. Everybody wants to harvest. And I thank God that he has allowed me to be involved in a couple huge harvests. But most of my years have been planting seed, planting seed, planting seed. So we've planted, we've watered, but God gives the increase, right? So we need to evangelize the lost. You want to please God? Evangelize the lost. You want to displease God? Then don't ever talk to anyone about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can tell you to emulate Nancy. Nancy's sharing the gospel on a regular basis. You follow her. You follow her example. And I'm sure there are others here as well that share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's important that we do that because that pleases God. And then uh, Paul writes to uh, Timothy regarding this. He says, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Now you don't hear Timothy saying, wait a minute, Paul, I don't have the gift of evangelism. How can I do the work of an evangelist? Well, Paul is telling every believer to do the work of an evangelist. Whether you have a gift in evangelism or not, we have that responsibility to obey the Lord. Well, seven, to celebrate the Lord's table. To celebrate the Lord's table. In Luke 22, 19 and 20, which we are going to do this morning, it says, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So it's pleasing to God when you partake in communion because you are remembering through this memorial that Christ suffered and died in your place. And then to care for one another. To care for one another. And we have all the one another's that we've been talking about in Sunday schools. Paul has led us. We need to uh, understand how caring for one another pleases God. You want to please God? You want to care for one another. Mike has, uh, and I can say this since he walked out of the room. No, Mike's still here. Uh, he's he's uh, called us a couple times saying, I'm at the store, is there anything I can get for you? That's pleasing to God. Just a little thing. But it's pleasing to the Lord. And that's what we want to do. We want to please the Lord. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Have you ever been to a prison? Have you ever went out of your way to minister to widows and orphans? That's the pure and undefiled religion that James is talking about here. And that pleases God. And so none of these are optional. All of these things please God. So we ought to do whatever pleases God. And at nine, to honor God in our marriages and our families. To honor God in our marriages and our families. And Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So you want to please God, don't commit adultery. If you want to please God, make your marriage what God wants it to be with Christ having the preeminence in that relationship.
And then the last thing, <clears throat> to be diligent and fruitful in all avenues of service. To be diligent and fruitful in all avenues of service. What's Paul say at the end of Hebrews chapter 13? He says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep uh, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus Christ our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So uh, when we do his will, and all of these things, these ten things are God's will, that is pleasing to him when we do his will. Well, let's just quickly look at verse 2 here this morning. Understanding God's word is that fourth pillar of faith, and he pushed it up to the front regarding sanctification because Paul understands that the word of God is the key to sanctification. We are going to grow in our relationship with God as we know the Word of God. So we need to understand God's Word. That is the pillar that he's applying to sanctification. So it's important that we see this. Look at verse 2. For you know that commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For you know, Paul reminded them that what he gave them when he was with them, what was expected of a believer in Jesus Christ. So Paul had taught them a lot of things. Remember, Paul often sp uh, spoke into the night, and then he would make tents. I was wondering when he ever slept. But he would make tents at night. He would speak often into the night, and it was incredible what he was able to do. And he was in his 60s, by the way. Uh, probably in his 50s here at uh, Corinth. But... Uh, uh, what does he say? He talks about the commandments. Parangelia. Parangelia is the commandments. Uh, this is the only other, uh, the only time commandments, the noun is used in the New Testament is here and in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 and 18. That's it. Now the verb is used quite often, so it's not like it's never uh, use, but here it means a, a military word. It's strong, it's authoritative, it's directives delivered by a commanding officer to his subordinates. That's the idea of parangalia. It is Paul talking, he's the four star general, and he's telling the pastors and the people in the churches to obey these commands. It's like he's barking them out. This is how we need to live. And so with that in mind, this strong word means that they're never to be taken lightly. They're never to be taken lightly. It was the word of the Lord. It came through the authority of the Lord Jesus. Obedience to God's word was mandatory. It is not option. We don't have the ten suggestions in the Old Testament. We have the Ten Commandments. Since Paul is giving these commandments, giving them is one thing, but obeying them is something else altogether. Paul says, you know the commandments we gave you, now live by them. And so he had a great expectation that they were going to obey the commands that he gave. Since Paul is about to deal with sexual immorality, something that we're going to see next week, that was not thought of as immoral in the Greco-Roman world. He was telling them that this was from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so it's important that they understand that God is telling them this. Doesn't matter what the culture says. God is telling them to do this. 
Now, just look at verse 8, and we'll see this in more depth next week. But chapter 4, verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians says, Therefore the one who disregards, it is not man he disregards, but God who also gives his Holy Spirit into you. In other words, if you have the Holy Spirit and you know God's word, you are usually going to regard it as most important for your life. If you disregard God and his word, you better check out some verses like 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. R.C. Sproul, in his book, Pleasing God, and that's a good book to read, by the way, regarding this topic. He talks about Sir Winston Churchill. Sir Winston Churchill is an interesting character. If you've never read anything about him, you need to. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And upon one occasion after the war, he was returning to Eton, the scene of his childhood education. The students were assembled to hear a speech from Eaton's most illustrious alumnus. Churchill was a word merchant, a master of the English language, without peer, the king of repartee. Of course, he had been challenged in debate on the floor of parliament by unarmed men. Fools took him on at dinner parties, always to rue the moment. In other words, you didn't mess with Churchill. He could outgun you when it came to the English language. Even the great playwright George Bernard Shaw had mustered his wit to foil the prime minister. Shaw, on the occasion of the opening of one of his plays, dispatched an acid-dripping invitation to Churchill. Dear Mr. Prime Minister, he wrote, here are two complimentary tickets to the opening night of my new play. One ticket is for you and the other for a friend, if you have one. Churchill, to his, uh, uh, you know, uh, repartee, I guess, Churchill dispatched an immediate reply. Dear Mr. Shaw, Thank you for your invitation and generous gift of tickets for your new play. Unfortunately, my schedule prohibits my attending opening night. However, I shall surely be in attendance on the second night, if there is one. <laughs> so, <laughs> he got him back, didn't he? <laughs> By the time Churchill returned to Eton, his fame as a speaker was already well known to every British schoolboy. The moment was at hand to hear the great man display his oratory. The assembly was hushed as Churchill approached the podium. He grasped the lectern and thrust out his chin in bulldog ferocity and said, never, never, never give up. And he sat down. Never, never, never give up. With one sentence, he electrified his audience. And I believe this should be the cry of every believer when it comes to pleasing God. If we're going to please God, we need to never, never, never give up. And that's one of the tenets of our faith, the perseverance of the saints. We are going to persevere. Those who are truly saved will persevere. But in our minds, we need to never, never, never give up. I believe that if those Ukrainian believers worshiping in subways, as bombs are dropping on their heads, can never give up the faith, how can I disappoint them? by giving up. How can I disappoint those poor believers over there by giving up? They look to us for strength as they look to Christ for strength. We need to never, never, never give up. Will you do that with me? Never give up.